Good morning, DCN. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Are you rejoicing this morning? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, we, we sang a brand, brand new song called Great is Thy Faithfulness today. And some of you are wondering, where is victory in Jesus? Well, it, it, victory in Jesus is still here. It's just, uh, I, I just l- leaned towards this wonderful hymn because it, it speaks of his faithfulness through the seasons, through the up and downs, even when we are faithless, he is so faithful. It's amazing. And um, talking about victory in Jesus, um, one of our family members in our congregation, uh, he, he went through eight weeks of chemo, and he found out this week through a PET scan that the cancer is gone. <laughs> victory, victory, victory in Jesus. <clears throat> and you might be wondering, why, Pastor Elijah, have we been singing that song for such a long time? Well, one of the reasons why, among many, is because every time we sang the second verse, I would look straight into his eyes. I heard about his healing. And I knew, I knew that God, he would. And we, we sang it as a family and as a congregation. And that's why we can celebrate together of his goodness. Amen? He is still in the business of healing, delivering, saving. He is the same God. He's alive. Oh, he's so good. Amen? Well, before I get into a testimonial time, let's go into the Word of God this morning. Today we are going to an Old Testament book called Judges, Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. And we'll be uh, diving into the whole chapter. Judges chapter 7. If you are using the Bibles provided for you, in front of you, it's on page 240. 240. Judges is very close to the beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament. Uh, Today we'll be uh, looking into a a very interesting story with a person named Gideon. Gideon. Any Gideons in this house? Okay, no no Gideons. Okay, but in your hearts we have Gideons, right? (laughs) In your hearts. Judges chapter 7, and um, it's, it's going to be a, a good uh, time of learning, discovering, and also unlearning some of the things uh, that may have uh, distracted us from the truth. So would you rise with me as I read God's word, Judges chapter 7. Early in the morning, Jerub Baal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Harod, And Harod means to tremble, to tremble. Okay, so these people were at the spring of trembling. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he... Gideon, and Purah, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites 
the Am Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. That means there's a lot of camels. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the, and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, very late at night. Just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shetta toward Zerera as far as the border of Abel Mahola near Tabith. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they took the waters of Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take your seats. Uh, Father God, we come in Jesus' name, thanking you for your grace and mercy and for your word. Holy Spirit, illuminate our hearts so that we may understand and know deeply of your love and truth. May that truth set us free this morning. And for those who are hurting, grieving, in bondage, in shame, and in guilt, I pray your comfort and your freedom over each person and family. We pray for reconciliation in tough relational struggles. And Lord, I pray that your will be done among us this morning. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's message is entitled this. Can everyone see okay? Okay. Today's message is entitled this, and I, I need your help. After reading Judges chapter 7, I'm going to test your comprehensive skills. So who saw too few and who saw too many? And you can raise your hand if you like, or shout it out. And it's in context about the, the army and the people. The army and the people. Who saw too few people, and who saw too many people? Gideon. Gideon. Okay. Uh, in this one or in this one? This one. Okay. So, Gideon. Gideon saw too few. Excellent. Great job. Well done, Monique. What about the next one? God saw too many. Okay. This 
is the title of my message. Gideon saw too few, God saw too many. But at the same time, this could be flipped around. Sometimes we see too many and God sees too few. Sometimes we see too few and God sees too many. So remember that, remember that. How many of you have forced a giant in your lives, a a formidable foe? Yes, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Heather. I see that hand. How many of you have faced um, an opposition or a rival, maybe at school or at sports, that you always try to kind of victor over them, but they always get one ahead of you? Yes, it's it's true. In in high school, and I was thinking back to this, this is almost 20 years ago. <laughs> 20 years ago. I, I used to play, um, I used to play uh, the, the game of football, which is kicking the ball with your feet. Uh, in this land, you call it soccer. So um, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I used to play uh, football all the time, and I was in, in the team, and um, I, I had, had some good skills. Although I was uh, small in stature, I had the speed of lightning, or so I thought. Sport. And so, um, you know, I, I was like really, like really good at this sport, or so I thought. But I was on the team, and my position was uh, left back, so I was a defender. And because I'm a lefty, um, they, they used me there. So during this game, uh, this was a team that we never had beaten before, and we were down, and near to the end of the game, y- you know, we're supposed to really score goals, right? So, <laughs> um, I, we're down by like two goals, so I, I go to near to the, the front and I'm helping the attackers trying to get this goal and I score three goals and we win the match was something that was happening in my head. It didn't happen in reality. So I was there <laughs> and um, trying to help and we lost. Yeah, we, we, we lost. It's, it, it was inevitable. They were stronger than us. And my coach, after the game, said, listen, Elisha, if, if you're losing and if time's almost up, there's no point defending the goal. You need to go out there and attack and try to get a goal in. And I, I listened to the coach, and I thought, yeah, I, I know that's true, but I was kind of afraid that we'll concede another goal, so I wanted to just defend I just need to defend. And I was, honestly, I was scared. Yeah, I was scared. I was timid. And uh, with that notion, with that notion, uh, I can relate to the person that we have read about today. His name is Gideon. Gideon is a leader of the Israelites. God raised him up. He's also called a judge. That's why this book is called Judges. It's the story of many judges that God raised up to lead the people of Israel. And uh, Gideon, he, he's not like your like, general. He, he, was a, he was scared. You know, he was timid. He, he was just awkward. You know those people when you meet them and, and you try to talk to them and they can never look you in the eye and they're always like, and their hands, they don't know what to do with their hands. They're just very awkward. Gideon is that person. Maybe I'm that person. You know, it's like, I'm just awkward. <laughs> How do I do this? How do I do this? You know, scratch my head. Just awkwardness is something that I, I have found with Gideon. But yet, despite all the awkwardness and timidness, God chooses Gideon, and that's what matters. Don't, don't miss that. Despite all the awkwardness or the inadequacy, that doesn't really matter. If God chooses you for his will, that's what matters. And yes, God chooses Gideon. Which brings me to my first point, if you're taking notes. Number one, assurance in the one who has called us. Assurance in the one who has called us. Gideon wasn't looking to himself. He was looking to God who had called him. Let's look in verse 1. Verse 1, we know that God names Gideon with a different name. It's called Jerub Baal. And in In the previous chapter, we know why God gave him this name. It's because he went against the the idols of that time and the Baal uh, idol. And we read in verse 32 of chapter 6, Let Baal contend with him, because he broke down Baal's altar. So Gideon, filled with God's spirit, went against the idols, and he got a new name. And a new name means a new identity. 
God chooses him and he begins to live a life that is assured, trusting in the one who has called him. The problem is, how does that connect to our lives? I mean, you say, yeah, well, that's good for Gideon, you know, that, that's good for Gideon. But how, how does that connect to my life today? God hasn't called me. I don't see him calling me up and saying, oh, uh, valiant warrior Carol Ann, I'm going to use you as a, as a well, we, we don't get those audible uh, messages. I guess some of us do, who are really close to God. But for, for me, um, I would say most of the time when God communicates, it, it's through, through his word. When you're reading the word, when you're handwriting out your chapters, as we're doing for Bible Project 2020, God speaks to you. How many of you have been blessed by the Bible Project 2020? Amen. That's great. Awesome. Awesome. I want everyone to be involved with this because this is revolutionary. It's changing our, our faith. It's changing our hearts. It's coming together by God's grace. The Holy Spirit is still moving among us today and speaking to us through the word, even through nature, even the, through the fellowship, and even through the preaching component of our worship service and, and our singing. Every component. God is speaking to you. I don't know what's going on in your lives, but God gives me a, a message through the word, and I preach it, and I sometimes hear testimonies uh, of, wow, you really spoke to me. And I say, wow, praise God. I, that's God. And many a times I find people saying to me, I don't remember a word you preached, but I just remember you jumped up and down while we were singing Victory in Jesus. I say, praise God for that too. Because God is communicating to you his love, that he loves you, that he is for you, that he embraces you, and he is coming after you with love and compassion, not to put you down in shame and guilt. And that's why we can be assured of the one who has called us. Point number two, obeying in the one who has called us. Verse two, let's go to verse two. The Lord communicates to Gideon and he says this, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. Okay, I, I need to um, help you understand this a little bit. I need to give you some context, okay? So... Um, I've broken it down. Uh, these are some numbers that uh, I, I wrote down before. And on the left column is the, the number of uh, Israelites and their men. So imagine you're having a battle, okay? Imagine you're having a battle. The enemy is 135,000 at least, okay? 135. Is that a big number? Yeah. Amen. Okay, that's a big number. And um, they are all armed as well. Uh, at the beginning of Gideon's, uh, I guess, uh, fight, he had 32,000 men that would follow him. 32,000. Is that a big number? Yes. But in comparison to this, is that a big number? No. Well, it's, it's very... It's like if you take the three zeros and the three zeros, the ratio is about this, 32 to 135. So it's almost 1 to 10. One man takes 10 men, and then you're able to win. God says, God says, God says, you have too many. Time out. This is what Gideon's thinking in my holy imagination. God, they've got at least 135,000. We have, th maybe you've got your numbers like zeros wrong. Some God, hold on, God. Are you confused? We, we lack. We only have 32,000 right now, and you're telling me you have too many. But Gideon, who is assured of the one who has called him and who obeys the one who has called him, says, okay. So God says, first, I'm going to um, give you something of uh, an invitation, okay? So he invites the 32,000. If you are fearful, if you are afraid, you can go home. Guess how many go home? Come on, guys. We read Judges chapter 7. 20? 
two, 22,000. <laughs> 32,000 people and 22,000 go home. So how many do we have left? 10,000, okay. So 10,000 10, compared to 135, again, take out the three zeros. That's 10 to 130. Wow, now it's like getting impossible. It started with slightly impossible. Now it's medium impossible, right? It's like, and then God says, you still have too many. You still have too many. So God gives them another um, um, invitation. <laughs> Take them to the water and see how they drink. And some of them will drink, as we found out, drink on their knees, right? Some of them lapped the water and brought it, right? And 9,700 of them were on their knees and they drank the water. And God said, okay, you can send those people home. So he's left, Gideon is left with 300. And at least he's fighting 135,000. Now, I take two zeros out here, and two zeros. I mean, it, it's no longer ratioable. It's like 1 to 45. Oh, sorry, 450. I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget. This ratio is impossible to the nth degree. One person has to win over 450 valiant soldiers to get the victory. So, all in all, all in all, we understand that God is up to something here. When God brings you to a point of impossibility, when God brings you in front of a mountain that you cannot level or climb, when God brings you before a sickness or an illness, when God brings you before a relational strain, when God brings you before a, a marital problem, when God brings you before a child that just won't listen to you, all of these impossibilities, let's remember this. God has a plan. His plan is this. Very easy. God wants to show off his glory. God wants to demonstrate that he is powerful enough to conquer the enemy. Conquer the mountain. Conquer the relational strain. Conquer this deep dark thing that you just cannot get rid of. God is up to something great when you are faced with an impossibility. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but if I see the odds of 1 to 450, um, it's like this. In the red corner, we have Gideon. Gideon and his army have no weapons, but they are about to fight. They have a trumpet and some pots and some fire. Maybe, he, maybe they can like smash the pots in their heads or something, but still one pot against 450. Against, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. But in the blue corner, we have these soldiers of might and valor, the Midianites, and, and they are so ready to fight. So even before you begin, your coach wants to just throw in the towel. Just give up. Just give up. But that's not how the story continues. Because God wants to show his love, compassion, power, presence, all of the above, to the Israelites saying, I am your God. I am the one that saves you. I am the one that provides for you. I am the one who will lead you. I am the one who loves you the most and knows the best for your life. And at the same time, what if they went into battle with, let's say, 32,000 and 135,000 and they fought and somehow, because it's a one to 10 fight, they win. They're going to say, well, we don't need God. We can just go out there and fight and we can conquer land. So it's okay. See, the pride can get in there too. 
God knows that. <laughs> so he, he eliminates that from the beginning. I find this interesting. When, when God cuts away the, the army, the first thing he does is anyone who is fearful, you can go home. I love God in how he's so personal and he's so nice. He's, he's just like, if you don't want to fight, if you are scared, you can go home. But God, in his wisdom, I have recognized this. Do you know that fear is very contagious? If you have 22,000 men that are like, oh, we're going to die, that will affect the other people. And that takes down the morale of the whole army. So God, in his mercy and wisdom, said, if you want to go home, it's okay. And then what about the, the 9,700? Well, honestly, I don't know why God says, you know, to Gideon, bring them down to the water and do, you know, see how they drink the water. But Jewish rabbis have studied this. The 9,700, the Jewish rabbis have uh, concluded in their studies that they, the 9,700 who kneeled were the ones who need the bow or kneeled before something else than God. And that's why God said, remove them. I don't know if that's the whole context, but for me, this is how I see it. This is how I see it. And, and you, you can study this, and then you can come to me with your thoughts. The 10,000 people are very thirsty. They come to the water. Gideon says, drink water. And these people who kneel uh, are trying to get as much water possible into their bodies, trying to fill their thirst. But the 300, I guess they just lapped it and, and put it to their mouths because they knew that there was something in the air there's going to be a battle. And how many of you have ran <laughs> with a lot of water in your bellies? Have you tried that before? I've tried it. I've tried it and I felt very sick. Because it's like every time I run, <laughs> and before the end of the run, I'm, I'm to the side, kind of like throwing up. But this attentiveness to, okay, there, there's something going on. So I'm going to tune into what God's doing. Maybe God was looking for that. I don't know. But this I do know. The reason why God cuts down the number is to show his glory, show his strength, and also to see if Gideon would obey. And Gideon did. So he obeyed in the one who called him. And we know the story. I, I won't go into it, but we know that the 300 men fight against at least 135,000 and they don't really fight at all. I don't see contact. <laughs> I don't see contact. And that's the amazing thing about our God. When God fights for you, you don't do it in the conventional way of like really fighting with weapons. You praise him and worship him and he goes and does the job for you and they fight against each other in the confusion, in the fear. Oh, I'm so grateful that God is on our side. I'm so grateful that I serve a God who fights for us, who goes before us, and who knows. And that's why I, I want to obey him. It's not a matter of, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I don't have to do this. And I want to, I get to, it's not that I have to. I want to please you, God. You are so good to me. I look back on my life and there are so many junctures of my life where I could have just died or gone to prison or fell into so much addiction and sin. But you saved me. You saved me. You saved me. And your track record is perfect. So why wouldn't I trust you with the rest of my life and continue to lift up my hands and say, I worship you. I will worship you with trumpets. I will worship you with singing and dancing. I will worship you because you are God and you know my enemies and you go before me and you crush them. That's how good you are. So the question is, why won't I accept the invitation of God? Come on board. Come on board, Elijah. 
So point number three is this, victorious in the one who has called us. Listen, victory doesn't come from our own efforts. Victory doesn't come from trying really hard. Victory comes from the Lord God Almighty. And that's why I encourage you to trust him, honor him, revere him. After the the troops dwindled down to 300, do you think Gideon was full of faith now? It's like, yes, God, I'm ready with the 300. I'm going to... Was he like that? Or was he still afraid? He was still afraid. I can relate to that. (laughs) I can relate. He's still afraid, and what God does, God doesn't, like, say, you little man of little faith. He doesn't do that. You know, he... God is so gracious in that, okay, Gideon, listen, let me uh, show you through an experience. Go down to their camp with one of your friends and listen to the dreams. Listen to what's happening. So he hears a discussion between the, these two men in the enemy camp. And this is the dream. Verse 13 and 14. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream. It's not I have a dream, okay? It's I had a dream. He was saying, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. This dream is not from the people of God, right? This dream is from the enemy. But God is so big that he can still use people that are pre-believers, not even believers yet, to do his bidding, to do his work. And Gideon listens to the testimony and the dream and the interpretation of these enemies. And do you know what happens to Gideon? Verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. Wow. Fear turned into worship. I I see a, a pattern here. When Gideon's fear is removed, belief comes to the surface, and then he worships. How many of you struggle with fear? Anxiety, depression, oppression? Okay, yep, okay. Fear is a real thing. And um, even this week, um, Jason and Brother Larry and I, we were doing our podcast, and we, we talked a little bit about fear. By the way, there's a podcast that we are making, and it's awesome. Um, when it comes out, I'll let you know. But um, it's going to help you connect the Sundays to the Mondays and the weekdays. It's going to be really good. Nonetheless, fear is a real thing. But what if fear was overcome by the power of God and trusting in Him, and then it leads to worship? And when you're in that place of worship, you're not the one who's in charge of the fight. God is is and we see that in this story i believe when gideon transitioned from fear to faith through hearing this dream that god has given the midianites into their hands that was the shifting point and then he's able to give god full worship even before the victory has been won And that's faith. Believing even before it happens. Believing that cancer is God in Jesus' name. Believing that God is for us. And honestly, the people around you in this world will say, you're a bit cuckoo because it doesn't make any sense. Like, let's just, case study number one. You have a battle between this much. God says this, this, and this, and this. This doesn't make sense. It's not scientific. It's not mathematical. It doesn't make... Well, let me kindly suggest. 
if you eliminate faith, if you eliminate God from the story, there is no story. But when God steps in, he turns this into a beautiful story of not only victory, but raising up one man, Gideon, from having a lot of fear to having faith in God, even before the victory has been given to him. And I think today, that message is for us. Do you have some obstacles in your life? Do you have some problems that you're going through? And are you just crushed under that fear or paralyzed by it or debilitated by it? Or are you going to choose to listen to the word of the Lord? Even if it comes from enemies, even if it comes from a dream, even if it comes from some other sources, and yes, you need to be discerning and wise about it, but as you hear from the Lord and it builds up faith in you, do you recognize what God is trying to do in your heart? He's trying to shift fear into faith and then into worship. And then, now you're in it. Victory is on the horizon. Oh, so good. And that's why we sing victory in Jesus. I love God because he doesn't force himself upon me. I love God because he comes to me like a cool breeze on a hot summer day. I love God because he's always wanting to communicate his love to me, helping me understand. And until I understand and until I'm, I'm convinced, he, he doesn't push me. He, he's not that stern headmaster type of God. If any of you are thinking like that, please, that's not God. God is a good, good father. And I'm convinced of his goodness. I am convinced. I am convinced so much that you cannot convince me otherwise. Not only you, but even my circumstances. If everything falls away, I still trust God. And I don't say this with pride. I say this with great humility. And I know I still have a long ways to go. But I am joyful because God is with me he loves me he is for me and remember that he's for you as well so how do you think of gideon this morning is he is he all right yeah is he someone to learn from I, i've learned a lot from him at least three things assurance in the one who has called him obeying in the one who has called him, victorious in the one who has called him. But there is one more thing I want us to learn from him. Look at verse 18 with me, verse 18. This is the instruction Gideon gives to the Israelites. Verse 18, when I and all of who, all of who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. And I didn't recognize this until this week. So praise the Lord for his revealing power. It's understandable that Gideon instructs the people to say, for the Lord, right? For the Lord our God. Yeah, follow God. But why does he add on his name? For the Lord and for Gideon. And this is the learning lesson that I want us all to have. Don't attach your name to what God is doing. Don't add on things to where God deserves all the glory and praise and the honor. Don't add on your name. Because this... <laughs> We'll find out uh, as you read forward. This is a start of something not very good for Gideon. Not very good at all. We ought not to add our names to when God calls us and he says, do this in this way. We follow it and we give God the glory. We don't add Elisha. We don't add Carol Ann or Carol or, with, or Jason or Steve. We don't add names onto it because all the glory belongs to God. Listen, this battle, this battle here,
It was designed by God and the victory was accomplished by God alone. Yes, Gideon had a role, but the Israelites, they don't need to say, for the Lord and for Gideon. All they need to say is, for the Lord. Only you, God. Only you deserve the glory. It's like this. Every morning, do you know, Satan comes to me with this word, success. Every morning. Don't, don't look at me as if I'm weird. <laughs> it's true. Satan says, Elisha, you're a pastor. You need to be successful. You need to have a lot of people in your church. You need to have a lot of finances in your church. You need to have a bigger building. You need more parking space. Success. Oh, you need all of that, Elisha. And do you know what I say? Get behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name. Because my goal in life is not to succeed. My goal in life, as is yours, is for my sanctification. I want to become more like Jesus. That's it. I want to become more. So get away from me, Satan. You don't belong in my head, in my mind. You have no room, no space. You have no authority over me. Get behind me in Jesus' name. But you know what? He'll try again tomorrow. And what do I do? My goal in life is to be more like Jesus. Sanctification and holiness unto the Lord is my goal in life because that's my calling. So get behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name. That's what I will say. And by the way, if I talk to you and if I begin to talk to you about like church growth and we need a bigger building, you come to me and ask me, have you prayed this morning, Pastor Elisha? Because I need you to keep me in check as well. And certainly I will keep you in check because that's my role as shepherd, isn't it? I care about you. I care about how much you are advancing to become more like Jesus every day. That's what matters. And it's the same here with Gideon. He's teaching us a lesson. Don't add on. Everyone say, don't add on. Don't add on. So, these are the applications for today. There are three do's. Everyone say with me, three do's. Three do's. And one don't. one don't. All right, here we go. Three do's. Everyone say with me. Assurance. Assurance. Obeying. Obey. Victorious. Assurance. Assurance in the one who has called you. Obeying in the one who has called you. Victorious in the one who has called you. And the lesson that you don't want to do, right, is add on anything else. No frills. It's very simple. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. All to Jesus. All for Jesus. All because of Jesus. Don't add on your name. I'm not angry at you. I'm just passionate. <laughs> I feel very passionate that we ought to follow the lesson that Gideon is teaching us. That we are trusting in God. Trusting in the one who has called you. Trusting and obeying in the one who has called you. Victorious, experiencing that victory and testifying of his goodness. But don't add on your name. Say, God did this in my life. It's God. It's him. Some people say we're a small church. Okay. What does that mean? Well, you, you have so many people. Oh, okay. Uh, I beg to differ. I think we're a big church. And they'll say, well, how do you define that? Well, I, I define it like this. Big church, small church, I don't really care about as long as we are the church of Jesus Christ. It matters that we become more like Jesus and we hold on to Jesus for dear life until he calls us home or until he returns we will hold on to Jesus and preach the message of Jesus crucified even if there are guns pointing at us, even if there is a blade to my throat, even if they try to harm my wife and my kid, I will still say yes to Jesus. And that's a big church. And all of you belong to 
a good church because why? God's presence is here. Don't come here if God's presence isn't here. Don't come here if the word is in preach. Don't come here because of Pastor Elisha. Come because God is here. Don't add on anything. No frills. It's simple. We obey the word of God. We trust him and we see his victories. Now that doesn't mean I don't want us to grow as a family of God. Because listen, we have a mission to make disciples and there are many disciples to be made in this region. 780,000 people live in the North Shore. Maybe about 24,000 of them know Jesus Christ. It's, it's quite interesting because um, remember this ratio that I showed you? Where's my ratio chart? I found it. So... Uh, 780,000 people and about 24,000 Christ believers. Do we have a mission? Do we have room to compete with other churches? No. We, we collaborate with the churches of Jesus Christ. We link arms. We spur them on because there are so many fish to catch. There are so many people on their way to destruction even today. They need the message of Jesus Christ. Even for those who are sitting in this room, maybe you ha don't have this relationship with Jesus. Jesus loves you. The only reason why you're sitting here today is because his divine love has wooed you. And let me tell you this. That one thing you've been searching for all your life is Jesus. And yes, your life story could have had a lot of failures and struggles and addictions along the way. But God is still calling your name. And he's inviting you to a relationship with him. Maybe for you, you feel like this. Put your name in here. Maybe you see too few. I don't have enough money. My job's not good enough. My house is so small. My kids are delinquent. All of these things. But maybe God sees too many. He wants you to cut, cut by his grace and you come down to the bare minimum and you see God's glory and victory revealed in your life because the only reason for that is for you to draw nearer to him and know that he is your Abba Father. Oh, Father God, we are grateful. I see our ministry here at Danvers impacting not only the North Shore but all over the world. My mission in life is to influence 7 billion people with the message of Jesus Christ. But it starts with each one of you. It starts with the one. But I believe it. It's his plan. I didn't make it up. He gave it to me. So church of Jesus Christ, let's wake up. Share Jesus with those you meet. Be Jesus to those in your workplaces, even to that boss who really annoys you, really annoys you. Love them. Be Jesus to them. Because the God of Gideon is the God of Danvers Church of the Nazarene. He is alive and well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your goodness, for your wisdom through your word your living word and we want to trust you god we want to trust you through the tough times through the good times and we want to honor you because you are god show us what we must cut from our lives reveal to us what does not belong and may we live our lives for the glory of your name and experience this joy of relationship
because of your great love to us and for us. How we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.